Uh, keep in mind that a latent fingerprint has trace amounts of moisture, oils, amino acids, and salts. And the way that we will process an item will be dependent on the substrate, but also on the what we're targeting in the trace amounts from this latent print. So moisture and oils are combined together. For moisture and oils, we're gonna use powders. We're gonna dust with powders to then be able to lift a print. That's like 99% of a fingerprint, a fresh fingerprint. Or because there's moisture there, it will evaporate over time. So if it's a fresh print within a day or so, we should have some good moisture and oils unless it's really hot out, it's in the sun. You know, we have all those environmental issues, but inside someone's residence, an object has been touched. If it's within a day, you're gonna get some really good results. With amino acids, less than 1%, that would be something we can find with chemical and the same with salts. So we're gonna talk about powders so what are we trying to do when we are dusting with a powder? Well, we're trying to apply powder so that it sticks to the moisture and oils of our latent print on a surface. And we want to apply enough powder to enhance the ridges so we can see the ridge detail. But we don't want to put on too much powder because then we'll start filling in the furrows, the space between the ridges. So there is a fine line there. Now don't let that scare you because what you're going to find out, this is incredibly easy to do. Incredibly easy. When you try this out, maybe your first lift, you'll have too much powder or maybe not enough. But after you've done two lifts, you start nailing it every time because you're watching what you're doing. You know how much you need. You know when to stop from that short experience. So it's not difficult at all. But as we are dusting, we will find a latent print. So what you see on the screen there are two latent prints that have been dusted with a powder. That helps us to then see the detail because that powder sticks to the moisture and oils. Following that, what we will do is lift that powder using fingerprint tape. And then we put it on a backing card. That's how you do it. Pretty simple. Let's see how, first of all, we just do something simple like dust with black powder to develop a latent fingerprint. So again, this is going for moisture and oils in the latent itself. Now, it might be that we see the latent. We've used some oblique lighting, and now we see it. And so we're going to develop it further so we can see it more clearly. Or maybe we just have a surface. We say, I think the suspect touched this. I'm going to check. And then you dust the surface, and you go, oh, there's some prints. Fingerprint powders come in different flavors. We've got black, gray, white, dual use, and fluorescent, to name a few. Now, why would we have black powders and then gray and white powder? That's if it has to do with your background. If you have a light colored background, using a black powder, you're going to see your latents pop out. If you have a dark background that you're searching for latents on, using a gray or white powder will then allow you to see the prints more readily. I just use black powder. And the reason why is I can take my flashlight, hold it at an oblique angle on a black surface and dust with black powder and see the prints come up. It takes a little practice and getting the right amount of powder on there may be a little more tricky, but I find it works well for me. Eventually, uh, you may end up doing it that way too. Uh, if you have gray or white powder, well, any of these powders, you have to have a separate brush for each one because you can't put brush with black powder on it into your white powder. You're now going to have the, the mixed. So you have to have separate brushes. 
Now, dual use powder is kind of interesting. Dual use is where it's half black and half white or gray powder mixed together. Well, if you just have the dual use powder, the idea then is you can go ahead and use one powder for any background. So let's say you use the dual use powder on a white background. Now, the black powder in the dual use powder will show you can make that lip. And then let's say you have a black surface. Well, you can dust with the dual use powder. Now the white powder shows. Further, remember I told you that fingerprint cards have a white back or a black back, depending on what color powder you use. Because if you use white powder and you put it on a white backing, you're not gonna see the print. Well, with dual use powder, you can dust a black surface, the white powder shows, but then you can go ahead and put it on a white backing card because now the black powder in the dual use powder will show. I really don't know too many people who use dual use powder. I'll say this, I don't know any CSIs that use dual use powder. Fingerprints, latent prints are fragile. And the more we process them with a brush, the more chance we have to destroy or degrade them. Well, if all you're seeing is half of your powder, you have to put on twice as much powder to see what you want to see. Could you be damaging the print? Perhaps. So most CSIs don't use dual use. You got your black powder, and if you need it, you got your white or gray powder. And uh, where I see dual use powder used more is in the, the kit for occasional use. So if you have police officers that will dust at their crime scenes when they take a report, like I had my officers do, I had dual use powder because it's a little less critical. And then there are fluorescent powders. Now, why would we use a fluorescent powder? Well, a fluorescent powder is really good for surfaces. The background, the substrate is confusing and it would be hard to see the print no matter what colored uh, powder you use. As an example, Oh, let's say you've got a granite countertop with all sorts of colors and patterns in it. And you dust it with black powder and it's hard to see what you get because of the background. You dust it with white powder, it would be the same. Or maybe it's a magazine cover and you dust it and that's a glossy finish. So you could consider that non-porous. And so you dust it with uh, powder. Well, if you use black powder, it may be hard to see because of the photograph on the on the magazine cover, or even with white powder. So if you use fluorescent powder on surfaces like that, what you then do is you hit it with the alternate light source and boom, all you see, mostly anyway, is the fluorescent powder illuminating on the print. So you see the print and you don't see much of the background at all. Then you can go ahead and lift the fluorescent powder, put it on a card. So that's the different powders. Then there are the brushes. They come in different types as well. The top one there is the camel hair or uh, rabbit hair uh, brush. The center one is fiberglass filament brush. And the bottom one is a feather duster. The feather duster normally we use with fluorescent powders. You can also use it with uh, standard powders, but I don't see people doing that, and I don't. I use it with my fluorescent powders. And then the center one, the fiberglass filament brush, they are the best, mainly because they're very soft, they hold the powder very well, and they distribute it well. The tape comes in different widths, and they come also frosted and non-frosted. And then the cards, so as we are packaging them, uh, we are going to fill out our cards. We're gonna give numbers to everything. Uh, here is an example that shows the black backing on the right here for using the, the white or gray powder. And then I wanna talk a moment about how we label the cards. So on the bottom right, it's a card where you had the information and the latent prints on, all on one side. I don't really like this type of card because people won't draw a diagram, but if you do, you have to put it on the back. 
I prefer the car, it's the one on the top left here. So when we are lifting a print to put on a card, we fill out the card, case number, date, time, the offense, the location, the address where you're at, uh, the victim's name, and then where you got generally outside of master bedroom window, and then your name and ID number. And then the important part is drawing this diagram that shows the window. And then you show little markings that show where your uh, prints are on the window approximately. And then your measurements. So this is 27 inches down from the top edge and 16 inches in to the center of these two. And then I also have a little arrow that shows which way is up. Then when we look at the back of the card, we have an arrow that shows which direction is up. That way later we can go back and reposition that, which could be very important for our case. Photographing where the latent is. Here we see a lot of busy work. This vehicle apparently has a lot of latents on it. And so they have put the markers next to each one of these. They are using letters for some reason. And then they photograph it so you can see these are all the letters and then the close-ups. There's really a nice set of prints here. If I was doing this photograph here, I would have someone on the other side of the glass put a piece of uh, contrasting paper against the inside of the glass so that you could see the prints without looking through the gla uh, glass and seeing somebody's hip pocket or the headrest of the, of the car. If you put something on the other side of this glass, it'll come out much better. DNA considerations. Using fingerprint powder is quick, inexpensive, effective, but recently there's been the issue of DNA transfer. So we need to be aware of it. As an example, let's say I bring out my favorite brush. This is my favorite brush. It has been used a lot. Uh, it has just the right amount of powder on it. I can start out dusting an object or at a scene without even applying any new powder to it and maybe go through half the scene before I need to add any powder because it holds the powder just right. It's broken in perfectly. What happens if I have used this at crime scene A and then I go to crime scene B and I dust for fingerprints, keeping in mind that fingerprints contain DNA? Well, quite obviously, there is the possibility I have taken DNA from crime scene A and transferred it now to the fingerprints of crime scene B. If later I want to test that fingerprint for DNA, I could be getting DNA from crime scene A instead of crime scene B. Well, if that's going to happen, what can we do? Well, you have to decide, is DNA an issue on my crime scene? And if it is not, then don't worry about it. But here's, here's the kicker. We can actually find old fingerprint cards and in the lab, they can separate the tape from the backing and get DNA from the fingerprint. That has been done. Well, if that's possible to be done, maybe today you don't think you're gonna have to worry about DNA, but maybe somebody doing cold case will say, hey, let's send these fingerprints off for DNA. So what do we do? Well, we need to use a brush that is not contaminated from another scene. So one way you can do that is to use disposable brushes. So here is a disposable brush. The next issue is the powder. So if you have fingerprint powder in a tub like this, and you happen to dip your brush in the tub as to load it, and you dipped in with your clean brush at crime scene A, use the powder, uh, the brush at A, and now you've loaded it at A again, and now you throw away the brush at A. 
now you have probably put some DNA in your powder from that second time the brush was in there. Then you go to your second crime scene and you say, I got a new brush here, let me load it up. Well, you could be picking up powder from the first scene. So again, we need to keep our powders free of DNA. So how do you do that? Well, you only load your brush with powder that you dump out onto a piece of butcher paper. Um, also, these supply companies make smaller containers of powder with a little peel off tab. And that's your one use powder. Now there's a lot of powder in it still more than you probably need. But the idea is I have my, my DNA free brush. I now open this up. I have my DNA free powder. I use it at the scene. When I'm done, I throw both of them away. The best way to do this is what you see on the right. It's a UV box and it's how you can sterilize or remove DNA from your brushes, even ones you've already used. So you have a supply of brushes and between uses, between crime scenes, and sometimes you'll do just one brush for the entire scene, or maybe you're gonna do it for one area of the crime scene, because you think that maybe you've got more than one offender and you wanna transfer from one to another. All depends on the circumstances. But you can put these brushes in this UV box, you hit the button and UV lights come on, and after 20 minutes, you can take your brushes out and they will have no DNA. Then put them into little Ziploc bags like this perhaps. And then when you go to the crime scene, pull one out, use it. When you're done, you bring it back to your lab and sterilize it again. That way you've got the best of all worlds because now you've got brushes that you've broken in that work well 